God, I've been comfortable for way too long. Please, forgive me. I know you want to use me to show your love in this world. Give me eyes to see needs of others, and a heart that dares to get involved where you are working. God, my life is yours. Whatever you want, wherever you lead, here I am, Lord. Send me. So I found that 8 out of 10 of the participants pray at least once a week, and about half pray every day. So most of us, we pray. And, and we tend to pray prayers like uh, we, we pray for our loved ones, you know, uh, help grandma who's in the hospital, or we pray when we're in need, uh, we pray when we need some direction. You know, we pray, I mean, sometimes we ask for green lights and open parking spaces and that our sports team will make that final play. Uh, we do all sorts of kind of prayers, and that's good, right? Like, I want to say that that's good because Jesus says, you know, come to God and pray, ask him. And, and you will receive, seek, and you will find. And so uh, whatever kind of prayers you're doing, I celebrate that. It's important to pray. But there's these other kind of prayers that are a bit dangerous, because when we pray them, they begin to do something to us. There's a transformation that begins to happen. They're dangerous in that sort of way, not in a bad sort of way, but in a, hey, things will never be the same sort of way. They're dangerous prayers. The first week we uh, pray, God, search me. And it's not because God doesn't know what's good in you, but the process of saying, God, search me, allows God to reveal to you things that you have done a really, really good job of hiding from yourself. We tend to hide things from ourselves. We tend to justify things. And when we pray, God, search me, God will begin to reveal those things that we know are harming us, but we just don't want to look at them. And the next week, we, we prayed a really scary prayer. It was say, to say to God, hey, God, break me. And the reason it's so scary is that some of you, maybe all of you, had your own season of brokenness where you know, you've been broken before. You've been down and out before. And why in the world would Pastor Scott invite us to pray that prayer? Break me. But the truth of the matter is, is that the prayer to break me is about breaking us of those things that stand in the way of you becoming who God created you to be. And you know you got some, especially if you're doing the first prayer, which is search me. That's revealing to you some things that you know you'd be better off without. So God, break me of my addiction. God, break me of my constant worry, of my fear. Break me of my bad attitude that I might have. Break me of my pride that says, you know what, hey, I've got it all figured out. Maybe a few tweets here or there, but the full of transformation in Christ, that's not necessary for me. Break me of whatever is stand in the way of God using me. So this week, we're praying the final prayer. These, these three kind of work together. Uh, once you have God search you and begin to break you, the things stand in the way, now you're in the place for God to send you. And if you read the scripture uh, at all, you're going to encounter these stories where God is calling people. And he's typically calling them to specific places to do specific things. But it's really short on details other than that. And God calls us as well, right? Not, not as we joked about in the children's sermon. He doesn't text. He doesn't Facebook. He doesn't call us on the phone. But God calls you. And you've felt it before. You've had that feeling that, hey, I should go there. I should get involved in that. I, I should go over and talk to that person. I should try that. God calls us in that kind of whisper on our hearts. Sometimes God calls us uh, in loud ways. It's like everybody in our life seems to be telling us the same thing. That you receive God's call. And the question is, is how are you going to respond? So I, I want to start off by looking at three responses that, that we find in Scripture about how you might respond to God's call. The first one is exemplified by Jonah. And Jonah says essentially, here I am, I'm not going. You ever respond to God's call that way? Okay. I see it, I hear you, I get it, not going. Okay? Not going there at all. And, and here's, here's the scripture that, that uh, we read. God says to Jonah, get up and go to the great city of Nineveh, some specific place. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. I want you to go to that place and do this thing. And, and here's what Jonah says. But Jonah got up and he went the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. Sometimes we say, God, I hear you. I get it. I'm not going. Other times we're like, I hear you. I see you want me to go there. God, I'm going this way, away from you, the exact opposite direction. 
I talk a lot about this mission trip that, that we're doing, and, and I think it could be a, a powerful thing for our church, but uh, the reason I believe that is it was powerful in my life. I went as a, a teenager on the Appalachian Service Project. And then in college, I felt a call on my heart. God called me to join the staff of the Appalachian Service Project. This mission organization, it brings about 15,000 volunteers into Central Appalachia every summer. And the people who really run the operation are college kids. 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 21-year-olds. They're the ones running the center. It is an amazing amount of responsibility for somebody that young. And they do tremendous work. And I felt God's call in my life to do that for a summer, right after my sophomore year. But they didn't pay much. And at that point in my life, as I've kind of started to tell you guys about, I was more of a frat boy than anything else. And so my social life was pretty important. And so I wanted to work and make money so that I could have fun that upcoming year. And so instead of going to where God was calling me to this life-changing opportunity, I went in the opposite direction. Maybe you've had an experience like Jonah. Hey, I'm not going. In fact, I'm going this way. I see it but I'm not going to do it. Moses, he, he gives us a, a, a different uh, response, something that maybe you've also done. Here I am, send somebody else. Send somebody else. Here I am, but you know, hey, uh, send somebody with the financial resources for that. Send somebody who has the time for that. Send that person over there. She, she's a stay-at-home mom. She's got plenty of time. She can do it. You're a stay-at-home mom and come out with your knife and her hair all messed up, no makeup on, saying you have no idea what it means to be a stay-at-home mom. Yeah. Right? Can you, right? Send somebody else. Not me. This, this is the story of Moses. Uh, God saying, now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people in Israel out of Egypt. I want you to go to this place and do that thing. And Moses, he's like, who am I? Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? Have you ever had God put a call on your heart to help that person? Get involved in that. That needs some leadership, and I'm calling you to provide it. Who am I? Do that. Send someone else. Now, the third response comes from Isaiah, an Old Testament prophet, um, one of the most powerful sets of writings in the Old Testament. And Isaiah, he says, Here I am, send me. Send me. Here I am, send me. Here, here's the scripture on this. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send as a messenger to these people? And I said, Here I am. Send me. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, um, I'll go, but who's going to be there? So my friend's going to be there? Because I only want to go if some of my friends are going to be there. I'll go, but how long? As long as it's only like an hour, I'll go. I'll go as long as, you know, I don't have to deal with kids because I don't do kids. Or as long as I don't have to get dirty because I don't like to get dirty. I'll go um, if there's, you know, these conditions. Does it pay well? Am I going to get, people are going to notice? Are they going to celebrate me? I'll go. Pay something. He doesn't say any of it. He just says, here I am. Send it. It's as if God puts a contract in front of him and there's nothing about what's going to be required and he just signs the bottom saying, I am your God. I am your God. Send it. Wherever you're calling, I'm going to go. Now this, this is kind of crazy, right? I mean, who does this? How do we get this sort of attitude? How do we begin to develop this sort of faith that God is actually going to send you, if you will say yes, God is going to send you to somewhere that, looking back, you're going to be glad that you went. Because that is the promise. That you have a Father in heaven who knows you, who loves you, who has prepared something significant for your life, and he's going to send you to the places where your life is going to be of deep significance if you will just trust and sign the bottom of that blank contract. Here I am, send me. The question is, well, what do you need to do fully surrender to God. This is kind of a, a scary prayer. This is a dangerous prayer. I'm surrendering my right to choose to you, Lord, wherever you want to send me, I'll go. What do we need to get this kind of attitude, assuming this is the kind of attitude that you would like to have? 
I'm encouraging you to think about it, to lean towards it, because I tell you, God will do amazing things through you if you can get this attitude of Isaiah. But how do we get So what we're going to do is we're going to backtrack a little bit in that segment of scripture from Isaiah, what what I read to you, the Here I Am segment, is from Isaiah 6, 8. We're going to backtrack and we're going to look at three things that you need to adopt this attitude of full surrender to a God who loves you and wants to take you to places of deep significance that in the end you'll be glad that you can. So the first one is, you need to have a genuine experience with the presence of God. The first thing to have an attitude of full surrender is you need to have this genuine experience of the presence of God. Here's what Isaiah says. He says, it was in the year of King Uzziah, the year that King Uzziah died, that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne in the train of his robe filled the temple. It was in the specific time that I saw God. When have you last had a genuine experience of the presence of God? Last week I, I, I shared with you, and I've, I've been pretty open about this. Um, thankfully, Hannah's okay with it. No, Hannah and I, we had a really rocky period in our marriage about three, four years ago. And it, it was tied to her uh, thyroid cancer, but as any couple that's been married more than a minute knows, uh, when you get two people together that have experienced the world differently, they're thoughts, right? There's challenges. And so we were going through a really difficult period. And in fact, I, I, I was in a period where I was, I was spinning, you know, I was lost. I was in a dark place. I like, you know how when you're in real pain, get this like almost cocktail of emotions and it's bound up all of emotions and you don't really know what it is, it's just kind of all consuming. So I was in that kind of place. And we were living in Glenview, Illinois at that point in time. And several years prior, somebody had given me like this old school, like 1980s uh, Fuji road bike. Okay? So you know what a road bike is? It's like with the really thin tires. And, and a friend of mine souped it up a little bit so like I could ride fast on that. And so I hopped on that bike. There's some trails by where I live, and I just, you know, for a good 25 minutes, I just rode as hard as I could because I had that energy. You ever had that energy where you're just angry and upset and ah? So I rode through it. And that helped. Some of us, you know, it's just a little physical activity that we have, right? So that, that began to help. And then thankfully, I, I received some training about what to do. And the training is really simple. You can do it for yourself if you ever get into a desperate place. And that, that was to begin to talk to God and specifically try to name the emotions that I was feeling. <clears throat> the first emotion that was blaring like really loud, which often is the case, was anger. I was angry. I was angry at my wife. I knew she was angry at me. I was angry at myself. I was angry at God. How could it be this sort of situation? I was mad. I was angry. I'm angry at God. Riding a little bit farther, right on this road bike, which, which you know, uh, little tiny tires, little tiny seat, that sort of road bike, and go really fast. And then, then I realized, I'm sad. Something feels like it's been lost. There's, there's a part of my marriage with Hannah that's been lost. Something's been lost for our daughter, daughter Sophia, who's in an environment right now where her parents aren't getting along. Something's been lost. And then finally, I realized I was scared. Still riding, angry, sad, scared. What, what's the future going to be like? What's, what's the next diagnosis going to be? Uh, we're in a job transition. What's that going to be? Am I going to even ever find work? Are we going to make it through this period? And as I began to name those emotions, that all of energy began to unwind a little. Like angry, sad, scared. Angry, sad, scared. A S S. I apologize for this. <laughs> but I gotta say, because this was the breakthrough. A S S. That's it. And, and in that moment, when that word came up, sorry, this is just my sense of humor, and I apologize for us in the church, but. But I, and that was, that's how I felt. And it was like a breakthrough. I was on that bike here and right on this trail, and, and I just started laughing. It was like God's sense of humor. And the even funnier part was, is I'm on this little road bike, right? It's got this little tiny seat, the kind of seat that 
people that are really serious, they wear like these special pants that have like pads on it. So as I'm thinking, I feel like ASS, my ASS is really hurting at that point in time. And it's like this breakthrough. All of a sudden, the things got lighter. I began to be able to see. And I felt God's presence in that moment. And I thought through, okay, well, when I'm scared, what should I do? Well, I need to trust. I need to begin to trust the God who I'm relying on. And so then I began to reflect. I began to reflect on all the times in which God had been present in my life before, which began to help me also with my sadness, not just with my fear, because I saw that even though I lost some things, I still had many, many things good in my life. And that allowed me to begin to have some understanding. And I began to have some understanding about why my wife was upset with me, and why I was upset, and, and why I was angry at God, and, and all that sort of stuff. And, and so it was, I was going to trust and reflect and understand. And so it was when you feel like ASS, say T R U S A truth. And this was powerful for me. In fact, in that moment, I was like, someday if I ever get a pulpit, I'm going to preach that sermon. It better be a pretty forgiving congregation. Because, you know, but, and so here's the moment, right? And it, 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 for me, it was a profound presence of God. I mean, I, I just kept riding all the way through this the whole time I'm on my bike. And finally, I had to get off because the seat is killing me. And so I ended up walking home. By the time I get home, several hours later, and I didn't hear it because I was in the presence of God experience the presence of God. I don't know what it is for you. Maybe a lot of people it is getting out in nature or going somewhere, getting away from it all. But you need to experience a genuine experience of the presence of God. Fully surrender. The next thing is a genuine awareness of your sinfulness. This is the hard part, right? Because in our culture we don't even like the word sin, right? We've talked about this before. We we prefer the word mistake. And one of the reasons we don't like the word sin is because we associate sin with condemnation. We associate that you're going to burn in hell and all that sort of thing if you admit that you're a sinner. But that is not the purpose of sin. And the interesting thing is, is that recognizing or having an awareness of our sin, it often comes just being in the presence of God. It's not that God has to point his finger at us and say, bad, bad, bad. It's just being in, in the midst of his goodness that we are able to begin to see Places that are broken within us. You ever been around somebody who's like a morning person, right? And it makes you realize that you're not. <laughs> or somebody who's like super fit and makes you realize you're not. Or somebody that's like really positive and makes you realize you're not. Or they're really organized and you're like, man, I really am a mess. You know, these people don't even have to point it out. It's just being in their presence. And if you get in a genuine awareness. Uh, 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 experience of God's presence, you'll begin to see your sinfulness if you trust God enough to let Him reveal it to you. Search me, know my heart, test me, reveal my anxious thoughts. If there's anything offensive within me, show me. And, and, and here's the thing about sinfulness this is the important part because it's holding you back whether you recognize it or not. And we all got it. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to deal with it. But it's not there to put you down. It's actually there to set you up. The genuine awareness of sinfulness is not to make you feel bad about yourself. It's about to set you up for the good thing that God has for you. And that's the third thing that we're going to get to in a second. I'm going to read this scripture. This is Isaiah. He's experiencing God, and he says, Then I said, it's all over. I'm doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I've lived among the people with filthy lips. I've seen the King, the Lord. This experience of being with God shows him the sinfulness. And it sets him up for the final thing, which is a genuine understanding of God's grace. God's grace. This is Isaiah's experience. He says, then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar of the palms. He touched my lips with it. He said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Notice the sequence. He gets in the presence of God, which reveals to him his unclean lips, his sinfulness. Something about being in the presence of that goodness shows us the work we need. 
And then because he has recognized that, God takes initiative through one of his heavenly creatures. And he does what it takes to remove his guilt and forgive his sins. This is the gospel. This is the good news. This is what drives Christian people to do extraordinary things. It's not because they have to or they should or what other people are thinking or because it's the nice thing to do. It's because they've actually sought a genuine experience with God and they've seen the extent of their sin at a level that they've been trying to hide their entire life. And in the midst of that, they encounter God's grace. The grace of God, which is sufficient but whatever it is that you think you have that if everybody knew about, you would clearly be rejected. All of us have something. And the good news is, is that, no, actually, if you can get real about that and be open about that, there's going to be a healing that occurs, and you're going to experience God's strength in the midst of your weakness, and it's going to transform you. And you'll be able to pray this. Sin. Send me not because I should. Send me not because somebody has to go. Send me not because, oh, I'll feel guilty. Um, I'll get dirty looks. They'll call me. Uh, no, it's, it's send me because what else would I pray after experiencing God's grace? It is the natural response to receiving something that you, at one point, didn't even know that you needed. But now you can accept yourself and become who you were created to be at a level that you never even experienced before, even thought about. Because you've removed all the barriers. You've let God examine you. You've asked for him to break you of the things that you now know have been standing in the way. And you receive the good grace of God, which transforms you. Transforms communities. Send me. <coughs> We typically pray, as we talked about at the beginning, we, we, we pray for what we want God to do for us. I, and, and that's fine, that's great. But what if we pray about what we can do for God? Is that part of your prayer life? You know, I'll admit, I get here in the morning and we have an alarm and I turn it off and it takes some time, sometimes like way more than others. I don't know why, it's just got this spooky sort of thing to it. And so I just made it a practice to just take that moment to pray the first thing that I do when I come here. And a lot of times my prayers are like, God, help me with my message, and, and this, and that, and whatever, and it's me, 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 me. And then I make a little bit of progress, and I start claiming God's promises. I say, God, I know you're going to be there with the message. I know your spirit's going to be here. And, but it's still kind of me direct. The next level, the best level, the place I'm trying to get us to is God. I know you're here. I know you're going to bless us. What can I do for you? Let me see those whom you want me to touch today. Allow them to shine a little bit brighter. If there's somebody in this space, and I prayed this this morning, who, who needs a little extra attention, who needs a hug, who needs a hello, let them just look a little different to me. Let me just catch something so that I'm available. Whatever you want me to do, send me. What can I do for you? Imagine how your life might be different. You start praying that. You know, I, I think the reason, and I can't, I can't prove this, but it's just a hunch. I think the reason that we don't pray this way, send me, what can I do for you, is that we're all afraid that God's going to go, oh, great, I need you to go to some poor village in Africa where there's no toilets. Stay there the rest of your life, right? I want you to be a missionary in Africa, right? We, we, we secretly kind of fear that if we just open up, you know, our lives to God and say, whatever you want me to do, that he's going to send us. And you know what? He might. I actually have a friend, Rick Cruz. That happened to him. He was in my cohort uh, at the hospital, the chaplains. They spent most of their lives in Kenya. So it could happen. But the more likely thing to happen is that God's going to send you to be a missionary in your neighborhood, right? Your workplace, or even in your own family, or 
here in your church. God might send you to work in the nursery, which is kind of like Africa, because they don't use toilets either in there. <laughs> might send you to become part of our kids program, and you're like, I'm not a kid person. And God's like, yeah, but you went ahead and signed your name, and I'm sending you there, and you know what? You might not think you are, but you're going to find out you are. <laughs> I might send you to be involved in things that you don't know. I might send you to a community group. I don't like to share. I find where I am. Yeah, but it's not all about you because a community group not only needs you in it, but other people need you in it for it to function. It's not just about your own growth. It's about creating a context where others can grow, where others can grow. I might send you to be part of our governance board when that gets set up. I might send you to be part of our, our buildings and grounds crew fixing things up in a couple weeks might send you to next or tomorrow night's meeting to help us plan because we haven't had your voice before, but we need it again. Might send you to something completely outside of the church context, and that's great too, because God's kingdom is far bigger than faith and the church of Christ. And what we're really about is creating disciples for the world and to, to spread God's kingdom. So it might send you to do something in the community. Which baseball. Might send you to be a mentor for this program called Starfish. I can tell you all about because I'm part of it. I send you to be a foster parent. Lord knows we need those. So what if we began to add to our prayers, and, and, and I invite you to continue to pray for what you need from God. God says, ask me. Come to me. Trust that I can do that for you. I will lead you. I will give you wisdom. I will open up doors for you. But what if we added this prayer? What can I do for you? What if we really began to say, send I don't care where you want to send me. I don't care for how long, who's going to be there. I don't need to know all the details. Just point me in the direction. Make my heart move. And help me take the first step to sin. So we're going to end today like we've been into the last few weeks. And that's what giving um, you all just a few moments to begin praying this prayer today. And, and I believe that if you would commit to praying this prayer, all week long. Just every day, even if you have no food, you just try it on. Send me, God, I'm, I'm an open book. I'm ready for whatever kind of change that you might have for me. But God's going to move in me. And so when you're praying that here, I've given you a card that you can put up on your refrigerator or something maybe on your mirror as a reminder, right? It's, it's a discipline. It's hard to start things like but on the back of that card, there's a place for you to write something. And while you're praying today or maybe this week, a word might come to mind, a place might come to mind, a person. And I encourage you to write that word, that name down. There's power in putting pen to paper. There's more intentionality. It's a greater invitation. And that's just for you. You don't need to share it with anybody. So I'm going to pray for you, and then we're going to give you a little bit of time to pray on your own, and we'll sing and we'll depart. Let us pray.